show. Hey, welcome everybody. Dr. Daniel Barth with you for the Halloween edition of the How Do You Know program. <clears throat> and uh, I want to uh, welcome everybody and say I hope that you have a safe and sane. If you celebrate Halloween uh, and you have fun with that with your family and children, please have a safe and sane Halloween. Uh, we want to have you back in our viewership again sometime soon. One of my favorite Halloween activities as an amateur astronomer <clears throat> is to go ahead and set a telescope up on the sidewalk out in front of my home. Uh, we live kind of far out in the country now. We don't really get trick-or-treaters up on the uh, hilltop where we are, but uh, for many, many years I would go and set a telescope out front, uh, put a bowl of candy out, and invite kids to come and take a look and I plan to go down. There's a, a trunk or treat celebration at a local church tonight. I'm gonna to take a big telescope down and we're gonna look at the moon and Jupiter and Saturn and other fun things. So <clears throat> I hope all of you uh, out there have a fun uh, evening if you celebrate Halloween. So it's traditional to do something scary on Halloween. So you'll be happy to know that there's scary stuff up in the sky. And uh, we have a relatively large asteroid passing by Earth tonight. It's coming by at a very high rate of speed, over 50,000 kilometers an hour. And this is asteroid 2022 RM4. And this is a new one. We just discovered it. People say, oh, we know all the dangerous ones out there. This one's newly discovered. And this bad boy is somewhere between 330 and 740 meters. So it's in the city killer range. Uh, a city killer like this would have continent-wide environmental impact. And uh, so if it's on the smaller range, if it's 330 meters wide, this could absolutely obliterate a metropolitan area the size of New York Tokyo, Chicago, Berlin, uh, it could just uh, decimate an area. And for something like this, the uh, impact, if it's on a hard, rocky area, uh, the blast wave is going to be knocking down buildings 40 to 50 kilometers away. Uh, your chance of dying within, if you're within 50 kilometers of a strike like this are very, very good. Don't forget your book. And... Uh, if we think of the area of a circle, pi r square with r being 50, um, yeah, that's thousands of square kilometers of devastation. Fortunately, RM4 is not getting any closer tonight than about six times the distance to the moon. And that seems like, wow, that's really safe. That's far away. Uh, yes and no. Um, we look at this and NASA has plotted its orbit out for about 100 years and says that uh, for the next century, give or take, we should be quite safe. But um, these objects can and do occasionally hit us. Uh, we did a program for those of you who are interested. Go back and look at the uh, How Do You Know program, When Asteroids Strike. And uh, we talked about an asteroid about this size. Uh, Paul, something this big will hit with an impact of between 20 and 50 megatons. And uh, that's, just, that's just a stunning amount of damage. And uh, for those of you who are saying, oh, but the Earth is three quarters water, um, no. Uh, an impactor like this striking an ocean basin would make a tidal wave that would quite effectively send the energy. And uh, if it struck in the mid-Pacific, uh, cities all along the seacoast, both uh, east and west, would see devastation with a huge tidal wave rolling in. Uh, and I don't know 
quite how big this tidal wave would be. It depends, I suppose, how big the asteroid actually is and what it's made of. Uh, keep in mind that if it's a rubble pile style asteroid, then about half of it's empty space. Uh, but when you're coming in, what really matters is mass and impact angle and impact velocity. 50,000 kilometers an hour is a very high speed for an asteroid. They run between about 15 and 75,000 kilometers an hour. 75,000 would basically be a head-on impact or something like this coming down can really do a terrific amount of damage. If it strikes the ground, ground impact temperatures will hit uh, between two and 3,000 Celsius. So uh, in incredibly high temperatures and pressures and the impact would be very scary indeed. So if you wanna look up more about that, this is asteroid 2022RM4. And if you'd like to learn more about spotting satellites and meteors, pick yourself up a copy of Star Mentor. We've started to get more reviews online for this on Amazon and other sites. And if you've purchased a copy, let me encourage you to leave us a review because uh, we love that and we love to hear from you. Star Mentor has more than 50 activities for you to do with a small telescope and binocular. And it explains not only how to do them, but how, if you're an experienced astronomer, to teach others to do them as well, because we want to share our hobby. And when we set up a telescope or binocular, people immediately come up and say, wow, you're the expert. Look at that big shiny telescope. And the questions immediately start coming and Star Mentor will give you answers and help you help others. So that's really exciting. Uh, tonight's episode is number 64, which, uh, wow, uh, we're really excited about episode 64 and getting this far. <clears throat> this one comes ripped right out of the pages of uh, Science News. And the title of this week's episode, Can Bacteria Survive on Mars? Uh, you may know that NASA has a planetary protection program. And what that office concerns itself with is when we bring stuff back to Earth. You may know or remember if you're old enough, if you're my age, you may remember that the uh, NASA astronauts came back and they were quarantined for a couple of weeks uh, and they came off of uh, the helicopter and they were immediately escorted into a quarantine station. It was basically kind of a modified camping trailer, about a 30 foot camping trailer. And they had to stay in there for two weeks after the mission was over. Uh, so we have a Facebook, Connor Bradley, what are your thoughts on quasars? Uh, I think they're interesting to know about. Um, yeah, Connor, quasars are really interesting. And uh, you know what? I'll put that on a uh, list for a future program in the next couple of weeks because quasars are lots of fun. Uh, when we talk about planetary protection, you know, we all know, we've heard that uh, NASA, <clears throat> the Curiosity rover, is collecting and canning, if you will, samples from the Martian surface, sealing them in titanium tubes. The idea that uh, they will be collected by a future rover and then blasted back off into space for return turning to the Earth. Well, if you're getting samples of rock, the overwhelming scientific opinion is that the surface of Mars should be completely sterile. So what's the issue? Well, we're not certain of that. We're not certain of that at all. And uh, we've never had a sample from Mars that's been cut from the actual soil of Mars and brought back and preserved. Now, we do have meteoric samples that come from Mars. I have a small one in my collection. And these are bits of rock that were blasted off the surface of Mars from a large asteroid impact, something like our RM4 asteroid. Something big in the kilometer class hits the surface of Mars. 
chunks of the surface will be blasted into orbit and beyond. Mars will lose bits and pieces. That impact energy, plenty to get something launched off the surface of Mars and beyond where it may fall inward toward the sun and eventually land on Earth. But consider the shock and temperature of a piece of rock near the impact site of an asteroid. Um, that's undergoing some pretty harsh high heat, high pressure conditions. And then when it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years later, it suffers another high heat event. So the odds of something from Mars bringing living material to Earth, relatively small. But uh, we worry about what if we go and collect a sample? Uh, these biocontainment procedures are there. Uh, we've returned samples of the asteroid Hugu and Bennu, and we're bringing these samples from these asteroids back to Earth. And so the people on NASA are very conscientious. Uh, other space agencies have similar offices as well. They say, well, if we're bringing something back from outer space, we don't want an Andromeda strain scenario. And if, if you were wondering what I'm talking about, uh, I believe it's 1972 film, Robert Wise, The Andromeda Strain. Brilliant science fiction. There's a nice scary movie to watch for Halloween. Yeah. Uh, and a bacterium comes back from space and uh, infects and kills lots of people. So uh, really kind of fascinating. But the other thing we worry about is how do we sterilize a spacecraft if we're flying and landing on Mars or a moon of Saturn like Enceladus or uh, places like this? How do we make sure we're not contaminating them with Earth bacteria? It would be a it would be a terrible thing to go in future years and have an astronaut scoop up a bunch of soil and look at it under a microscope and say, "Wow, gee whiz." Look, there's bacteria only to investigate and find that it's, you know, a common E. coli that's found on Earth and was distributed because somebody was sloppy about sterilizing the rover wheels. Uh, so these landers go through extraordinary decontamination. They are much cleaner than an operating room would be, and they use heat radiation, chemical sterilization. They use all sorts of methods to make sure we're not taking any terrestrial biomaterials and contaminating a surface. Uh, so when we talk about this idea, how do we in fact sterilize a surface? If we're here on Earth and uh, you're a biologist uh, working with bacteria or you're uh, a surgeon or a veterinarian or, you know, just cooking in your kitchen. Uh, how do we sterilize surfaces? Do we need to sterilize every surface that we work with? And we talk about hand sanitizer and we talk about sterilizing and there's products that say, our product will disinfect your kitchen and bath. Well, what's the difference between disinfect, sanitize and sterilize? Turns out the differences are pretty extraordinary. Let's take them from the most extreme to the least extreme. Let's start with sterilization. Turns out that if we're talking about sterilizing something, we're talking about removing all microorganisms and spores. And uh, it's important to make a distinction when we're talking about microorganisms, we're talking about bacteria and viruses. Bacteria, of course, are living cells. Viruses, oh, we could, we could start an argument about that, about whether viruses were alive or not. They certainly don't reproduce by themselves, but they're capable of taking over the cells of other living things and using them to reproduce. The spores are different. Spores are when bacteria or fungi are in adverse conditions and they secrete a coating and they produce essentially uh, like an antifreeze internally. And they excrete as much water as they can, and they become a dry powder. And these spores are 
completely inactive. They're not alive. They're in suspended <laughs> animation. But if you give them warmth and moisture, then they can come alive again after a long, long time. Sterilization kills all life present. It absolutely kills everything. To do this, the typical measure, we use pressurized steam, a device called an autoclave. I've used one many times in my research career. Uh, you put equipment or specimens you want to make sure are dead into an autoclave and it's basically, it's like a pressure cooker. If you have a pressure cooker at home or if you've used one, except this one will go all the way up to two atmospheres and it will raise the temperature to 250 Fahrenheit, uh, which is about 120 centigrade. And you hold this pressure and temperature for two to three hours, and then you let it cool down and depressurize very slowly. And then when you take out your surgical instruments or your auger plates or whatever else, they are completely sterile. We can also use chemical methods. We can use hydrogen peroxide gas. Um, this is under the don't try this at home kids uh, warning label. The hydrogen peroxide you may be familiar with in your bathroom is 3% in water. And uh, it's very interesting. If you look it up on YouTube or some other uh, uh, source, you can see videos where you add hydrogen peroxide to bacteria and you can watch them and bubbles start to form not only around the cells, but inside. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, passes through cell membranes just like water, but then it reacts with catalysts inside the cell and oxygen is released and bubbles start to form and they keep expanding and eventually the cell wall just bursts and it dies. Uh, you can use ethylene oxide gas this is a gas that destroys DNA and cell membranes. It's also an extreme oxidizer. Uh, we can also sometimes when we want to sterilize things that can't be subjected to extreme chemicals or extreme heat, we use ionizing radiation. It's not uncommon to have a radio sterilizing where we have a sample of cobalt 60 or something like that. That's a gamma ray emitter. And you put your things in there and it irradiates it. And interesting, you can use fruit and vegetable matter, meats, milk, and you can put them in and irradiate them. It destroys all the microorganisms, bacteria that may be present, but it doesn't harm the edibility of the food. I know a lot of people will go, oh my God, irradiated food. Um, hello, the tomatoes on your <laughs> vine in your garden. Uh, they get irradiated by ultraviolet and gamma radiation every single day, and they're perfectly tasty and healthy. Uh, pesticides are a much worse hazard for you because they can linger on the surface of the fruit. Radiation does not. It passes through, it kills the bacteria in place, and it doesn't change the vitamin content or nutritional quality of the foods at all. You can use dry heat raise something up to 320 Fahrenheit for at least two hours. That's about 200 centigrade. Or if you've got liquids, you can use ultra filtration, something that will pass a liquid, but not a biological cell. One of the problems with ultra filtration, it doesn't protect against viruses. Viruses are too small. So that's sterilizing. Well, what's disinfecting? Disinfecting means we're removing most of the harmful organisms from surfaces. It doesn't, disinfecting generally doesn't penetrate into anything. Uh, usually a disinfectant is a liquid or a spray. And uh, generally to work, you need to leave those on a surface for 20 minutes to 12 hours. So if you've got a brand name disinfectant and you spray your counter and then you take your paper towel and you wipe it off, um, it's not going to do a very good job. Uh, if you want to disinfect your kitchen counters, you want to spray down with a disinfectant, walk away, come back half an hour later and wipe it off. Um, most people will consider this a lot of trouble and you would ask, well, gee, does a disinfectant spray do any good? Yes, it does. Most disinfecting sprays uh, have 
detergents in them and they clean dirt away and they clean microorganisms away. And you have to realize human beings have grown up in an environment saturated with microorganisms. You think about prior to, uh, I don't know about you kids, but I drank water out of a hose in my garden when I was a boy. Uh, when we went hiking, we would drink out of streams and this was very, very common years ago. Not so much anymore, but the idea that your gut has a microflora, microbiota, which are present in large enough numbers and they will work to attack bad things if you ingest them. And so when we disinfect all the time, we kind of weaken our ability to respond to challenges this way in the environment. And if we get the uh, traveler's revenge, uh, we go somewhere and drink water we shouldn't or eat food we shouldn't that hasn't been properly cleaned and the natives there, wherever you're talking about, the people that live there eat and drink these things all the time without problems. It's just that we're challenging our uh, our bodies with an unusual bacteria that we're not used to. So this disinfection, yes, it's works. It's what most people do around the kitchen and bathroom. Uh, and these disinfectants will kill bacteria and viruses, most of them. Uh, but it's not very effective at all on spores. If bacteria have sporulated, if viruses have sporulated, uh, disinfecting doesn't do much good. Sanitizing is the lowest standard. All sanitizing says is it lowers the number of bacteria and viruses to an acceptable level. And you say, well, acceptable to whom? Well, uh, sanitizing just it's just like swatting a few of the flies in your, in your house. Well, there's not as many, I've swatted 10 flies. There's not as many now. I don't have to wave them away from my food all the time. So it's okay. <laughs> sanitizing also doesn't really remove the germs. Sanitizing uh, doesn't involve uh, actually physically scrubbing or cleaning or removing dirt from a surface. So sanitizing is the very lowest level. And when we talk about sterilization, we we're usually talking about very high heat, very high pressure, very caustic chemicals. Um, sterilizing, if you really need something sterile, you probably want a professional because, um, well, let's just say if you really, really need it sterile, then doing it yourself, if you're not trained, probably isn't going to do the job you need. But do we need our kitchens or bathrooms sterilized? No, generally we do not. What's this got to do with Mars, friends? Well, think about this. We have talked on this program before. Could life have started on Mars? If it did, it was probably in what's known as the Hesperian period. Uh, the Hesperian period went from about three and a half billion years ago to about one to 250 million years ago. And this was the period when Mars got a lot drier and colder. If you'd like to learn more about that, uh, the book I'm recommending this week is called The Red Planet by uh, Dr. Simon Morton. And this is a lovely, very readable chronicle of the natural history of Mars. And it takes you through all the periods of Mars formation, what happened when the atmosphere was thick, when Mars was wet. And as Dr. Morden points out more than once, uh, the clues we have are often contradictory. And we often have more than one theory about exactly what happened to Mars. And when was it warm? When was it wet? When was the air pressure higher? What was the air pressure like then? What was the geological record mean? Uh, and there are features we can see on Mars, like uh, the great divide between the north, the north and the south, uh, the south being many kilometers higher in elevation than the north, the Tharsis Bulge, the Mariner's Valley, and uh, various areas that show uh, evidences of running water and clays and clay-like deposits. That would be an ideal environment for biology on Earth. 
and we say, gee, with all this wet, warm environment, did Mars ever develop life? And it comes down to how does life begin? How do you get life from lifelessness? What on this show we've described as autobiogenesis and how long does that take? There's indications from the earthly fossil record that life arises very quickly within a few tens of millions of years of when the conditions are right. If the conditions are right for life to form in a very short time, life will exist. Life will spring to being. It certainly did here. But um, as we know, talking about science and data, when you have just one case, uh, it's dangerous to draw wide and general conclusions from it. Uh, we haven't gone to Mars with people, taking nothing away from the rovers from NASA and the ESA and the Chinese and all these brilliant folks who send rovers to Mars. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, amazing robotic machines, but it's not the same as people. People have... Uh, your intelligence is right there. You don't have to worry about your AI. You can have a very highly trained astronaut crew right there on the ground with the scientific instruments and the ability to climb, to jump, to run, to go, ooh, over there. That's an exciting place. Let's go dig there uh, to make judgments and to do analyses with sophisticated equipment that's right there with them. So... Did life form on Mars? We don't know. Uh, there are people who argue yes. There are people who argue no. There are people who argue that it must have done. And there are people who argue that, oh, no, no, it could never have done. But it's all guesses. It's all guesses at this point. So when we're talking about, well, but Mars got really hostile for life, right? Mars got colder and drier. Sure, we had liquid water in the Hesperian period on Mars and the atmosphere was thicker, but since the Amazonian, the last half to quarter billion years, Mars got really cold and really dry and it lost maybe 90, 95% of its atmosphere. The surface was dehydrated, water sublimated away. The only place you can have free water now uh, even in its icy form is underground because if you throw an ice cube on the surface of Mars, it will simply sublimate away. It will turn from solid directly into gas. The gaseous water vapor will drift away and that gaseous water vapor is subject to decomposition by the sun's ultraviolet rays. The hydrogen and the oxygen split apart. Uh, the oxygen may remain and react with stuff on the surface, but hydrogen will drift away and be lost to space forever. Um, so we know liquid water has still existed underground until perhaps 10 million years ago. The Amazonian is the most recent period on Mars. And uh, we know we had liquid water recently. We know that because we see evidence of flows, we see evidence of upheaval, we see evidence of outburst floods. We see all sorts of evidence that liquid water existed on Mars relatively recently. Within the period that human beings in our present form have been on Earth, liquid water has existed at least below the surface in pools, in lakes, in flowing channels and rivers. Uh, that's all cold enough that it appears to be all frozen and locked up solid now. Uh, we know the atmosphere got thinner. We know the magnetic field failed and the solar wind stripped all the lightweight gases away. Oxygen and nitrogen gases were all expelled from the atmosphere of Mars. It was left with a CO2 atmosphere and uh, it's now over 95% CO2. And, uh, the low pressure caused all the water that was near the surface to just sublimate away. It would have been split in the atmosphere by solar radiation and then carried away. But subsurface ice and perhaps subsurface liquid water 
was protected by coatings of dust and rock that protected it from the wind, from the direct solar radiation. And uh, so we say, well, Mars has gone from warm and wet to cold and dry and frozen. So did that kill? Would that sterilize the surface? Would this massive planetary drying and stripping of the atmosphere and the freezing of the water, locking it into ice in the ground, would that great drying kill off bacteria? And the short answer is no, it would not. And uh, this freeze drying process is called lyophilization. And uh, I'm not going to spell it for you. You can look it up, L-Y-O, lyophilization. Lyophilizing, freeze dying, drying was invented in France uh, about 115 years ago. And today it's widely used to preserve food and biological samples. I worked for a while at the Northern Regional Research Laboratory in Peoria, Illinois for the US Department of Agriculture and uh, work there on some microbiological research. They have at the USDA labs, a freeze dried or lyophilized collection of bacteria and fungus, which they preserve whenever they get new samples of new bacteria and new fungi, they freeze dry them. They uh, put these materials in a small test tube. They, at the time, they may do it differently now, but at the time, they would immerse them in a bath of dry ice and acetone, which gave you a temperature of about 185 below zero. And they would flash freeze, and then they would put the glass uh, vials under vacuum for a number of hours. The ice would freeze, and under the vacuum, it would sublimate away and so this process freezed and dried the biological samples. Both bacteria and fungi would sporulate under this cold drying process. They create a protein shell around themselves. They expel water and they create molecules that essentially act like an antifreeze that keep ice crystals from growing too big and rupturing the cells. And these cells encapsulate themselves. And in this freeze dried condition, one of the things my office did was we would take old samples, 20, 50, 100 years old, and we would crack them open and say, ah, oh, is this sample still viable? And uh, to my knowledge, we never found a sample that freeze drying killed. Let that sink in for a minute testing old samples that were many decades old, we never found a sample that freeze drying killed. You could crack open this little tube, shake this material out onto a plate of auger at nice warm room temperature and smear it around. The bacteria would grow, the fungi would grow, the organisms would come back to life. The genetic complement was exactly the same. We hadn't damaged the DNA. These things were just in suspended animation. <laughs> and so universities around the world use this process now. If you're a researcher and someone from say a university in Shanghai or Peoria in Illinois or Berlin, and the scientists have published a paper on an interesting microorganism, be it a fungi or a bacteria, you can write to them and say, wow, I'm from big name university and I saw your exciting paper in microbiology today. And I'd like to have a sample of your exciting bacteria 2022, you know, XYZ4 and please, and they will send you a sample <laughs> and uh, you get this sample and you can essentially reanimate it and uh, the samples come out of the deep freeze and the dry conditions and they're perfectly viable and you can work with them and there you have a sample and it's genetically identical. So freezing and drying doesn't kill anything. So the question becomes, okay, well, if Mars had life, 
Did this big freeze drying period kill it? The answer is absolutely no. But we've all heard that, golly, um, Martian surface conditions are really nasty. Uh, very harsh indeed. Air pressure is about 1% of what we have here on Earth. Uh, there's less atmosphere, which means cosmic radiation just comes right in. We know on Earth, cosmic radiation stops and creates this shower of lesser particles because it collides with the atmosphere. Cosmic radiation doesn't often penetrate uh, beyond about 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere. Uh, we know that there's no significant magnetic field to deflect charged solar particles from the solar wind because Mars has no internal dynamo. It has no flowing mantle layer uh, that creates this magnetic field. Um, there's little heat retention. Mars doesn't have a greenhouse effect. And more's the pity because Mars loses heat very, very quickly. The surface temperatures range from about 21 centigrade, comfortable 70 Fahrenheit, down to about negative 128 C, which is 200 below Fahrenheit. The average daily temperature is about 60 below zero centigrade. That's about minus 80 Fahrenheit. And darn, that's cold. However, uh, we also know that the surface of Mars gets a lot more radiation than Earth does. And this seems counterintuitive because we are, oh, give or take 50 million miles closer to the sun. Since we're closer, one AU instead of one and a half, shouldn't we get more radiation than Mars? Yes, but our atmosphere and our magnetic field serve as radiation shields that block this dangerous radiation from the surface. And our life, both animal and vegetable, and fungal bacterial have all evolved to be quite comfortable with the amount of radiation we get here. And this includes radiation from the soil and rock and radiation from the sky, be it solar or galactic. And our cells have mechanisms where if we get radiation damage, hey, we, our cells can repair themselves. They have mechanisms where they go, they find a damaged section, they cut it out, they rewrite it, and they repair it. And uh, it's really quite amazing. Matter of fact, some bacteria are better at this than other bacteria. You may have heard it's kind of a meme. After the nuclear war, cockroaches are going to be the only animal surviving because the cockroaches can take a lot more radiation than you and I by about a hundred times. And uh, yeah, that's true indeed. But there are bacteria that can handle a lot more radiation than that. Uh, the bacteria, one of the ones we're interested in is uh, Deinococcus radiodurans. And uh, the very common I'm, not gonna say, I'm just going to call it E. coli, uh, Escherichia coli. And microbiologists listening in, apologies if I botched that pronunciation. But E. coli and D. radiodurans, when we were Come on, Dr. Barth, operating you can more nuclear do it. plants, and we would take the fuel out and go and check and make sure we found, holy cow, there are colonies of bacteria living inside our nuclear reactor. And this surprised <laughs> everyone. This is how radio Durans, or I can take more radiation than you. This is how radio Durans got its name. I got a question uh, though. Sure, go ahead. Do you think that's what roaches are made out of? No, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if there's you a similar cellular mechanism. You can't kill them. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that radio durans and E. coli, and we worry about E. coli, and every once in a while you'll hear, oh, somebody got sick from E. coli, from contaminated food, or improperly pasteurized milk, or cheese, or lettuce that wasn't properly washed, and uh, E. coli e infection, where it's dangerous for people, 
usually happens for the people who are older and have uh, immunocompromised or they have comorbidities, people who are elderly and ill, uh, or very young children who haven't got a fully developed autoimmune system yet. Well, most of us, E. coli is just part of our environment. And if I were to, you know, pick up my mouse here and take a swab and go swab, swab on the side, and then I were to plate that out, um, it's almost certain there's E. coli on my computer mouse. It's almost certain there's E. coli on my spectacles, in my beard. Uh, and that sounds, ooh, that's gross. But you have to understand that human beings share the earth with by far the most populous type of organisms are bacteria. There are trillions that live in and on our body. And for the most part, they are healthful and helpful. And this bacterial population helps us fight off the rarer, more dangerous germs that we may encounter in our environment. And so they're like this helpful microbiological army that fights for us. They aid us in our digestion. They help release nutrients from the food we eat. Um, they are our true symbiotic partners. Well, uh, but these Erythra coli, the E. coli and the Deinococcus radiodurans, these critters produce lots and lots of antioxidants. And if you are a uh, person who's concerned about health and eating right and all of this, I'm sure you may have heard about eat foods high in antioxidants, things like blueberries, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. They're all high in antioxidants. The question is, if you eat them, do they actually get into your cells? And I question that. And I, I'm, I'm afraid we're getting beyond the realm of my expertise. I am not a uh, professor of microbiology or uh, microanatomy. But certainly I do know that these two species, which are very radiation resistant, produce lots of antioxidants and the antioxidants protect the DNA from damage. They help fuel the repair of damaged DNA, whether that damage is from chemical agents or radiological agents. If your DNA gets damaged, then antioxidants go ahead and uh, give this protection to you. So, people were noticing these radio durants and they said, oh, Mars has a, is a high radiation environment, nuclear reactors inside our high radiation environment. And these bacteria live inside our radio, you know, our, our nuclear reactors, where, where the nuclear fuel is, where the reaction is taking place. And could they survive on Mars? Someone got a brilliant idea for research. And this is, this is why we fund pure research, because these things take us into clever and ingenious places where we haven't been before. Well, it turns out, they studied one thing. It turns out if your bacteria are freeze dried, if they are lyophilized, they improve the cell's ability to resist radiation by many, many times. So they have this multiplying effect of radiation protection because it turns out that DNA, which is freeze dried, well, when we damage DNA, say we get uh, uh, a UV ray strikes my skin and creates damage in my skin's DNA. Well, it turns out that this is a chemical reaction, this breaking of the DNA is a chemical reaction. And you know what? Being inside a cell in an aqueous or water bearing environment makes that reaction much easier to do. It makes it in some effects possible. If DNA is in a dehydrated low temperature state, it's much harder to break. It's far more difficult by many, many times to damage so it becomes just freezing 
and drying make the bacteria many times more radiation resistant. Freeze drying, however, doesn't damage the antioxidants. They're still fine. And so they did a test and they said, well, NASA friends, how much radiation is on Mars? I'm not going to go into millirems and all the dosages and things, but uh, they got data on how much radiation was on Mars. And they said, oh, okay, uh, how good is soil at blocking radiation? Well, why do you ask? We think today that the most habitable environments on Mars would be subsurface ice. We know that in places like Antarctica, like the dry valleys, the Allen Hills valleys in the center of Antarctica, where they get, oh, a centimeter of snow per century, the driest, coldest desert we know of, we know that there are bacteria that live not only in the ice, but they live in the quartz veins inside the rock. The quartz veins provide a skylight, if you will, to allow visual, visible, and ultraviolet light to pass down through. And hey, a reaction from ultraviolet light powers one chemical reaction at a time. These things live and multiply very, very slowly. But in fact, if you go to any of these dry valleys and you find these rocks and they have this coating, which they call a desert varnish. Well, if you scrape away this coating, it's living material. It's sporulated fungal material. These cells, these fungi and algae uh, have coated the surface and they react very, very slowly. They grow very, very slowly, but they're also highly resistant to the radiation from the sun. And so they said, oh, well, soil's a good preserver of radiation. Any of you remember the days of civil defense and build a bomb shelter in your backyard? One of the things they said is put it underground. Why? Because several meters of soil is a really effective shield against radiation. And, oh, coincidence. 10 meters down or so is the most habitable region of Mars because of temperature, because of shielding from surface wind, shielding from surface radiation. And they tested these bacteria and said, oh, how long could they last? The answer they came up with, up to 280 million years. So you take an average cell and it's going to survive 280 million years under the full glare of Martian solar and cosmic radiation. And, ah, well, if you're talking about this sort of environment being sheltered from the radiation and sheltered from the surface temperatures and sheltered from the winds and sheltered from the dust storms and the water there is sheltered from evaporation, because it's covered with soil, which keeps the pressure up, which stops sublimation. And you get this idea that, gee, living underground on Mars would be a great thing to do. Uh, one of the things we've talked about for human colonies for years is putting a colony inside a lava tube. There are huge lava tubes, many tens of meters wide uh, in the Tharsis region. You could put a colony in there, why? because it's nice, it's smooth, it's already polished, it's ready to go. We could seal it off easily and make an environment. It's underground, it's sealed from the radiation. And uh, underground, 10 to 50 meters underground, your radiation is only gonna be a fraction what it is on the surface. In fact, 50 meters underground, you're gonna be getting substantially less radiation than you do on the Earth's surface on a sunny day. Warmer temperatures, Heat is still radiating out of the interior of Mars, just like Earth and any other uh, planet. And this heat is trapped by the surface soil. So you've got warmer temperatures. If anyone here has ever gone down in a cave, uh, you know that caves on Earth have constant temperatures of around 15 to 18 Celsius, around 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I've been in Mammoth Cave 
in Kentucky. I've been in the uh, Carlsbad Caverns, and they are cool, but they're very pleasant. The Mammoth Cave in the winter, the temperatures outside were below zero centigrade, and the temperatures inside were relatively comfortable, 15 centigrade, and it was quite nice environment. The interior heat of the earth isn't lost to the exterior. So you've got warmer temperatures and higher pressures. One of the things that causes water to go bye-bye on the surface of Mars is low air pressure. This low pressure causes the ice to sublimate away. The high pressure means it's much more likely that the ice hangs around and it even becomes possible for water to become liquid. Uh, and so you've got conditions which are much more favorable to cell integrity a few meters down inside the surface. We know the Phoenix Lander scraped down. It got about, oh, 10 centimeters down and they struck ice. They were stunned by this. They were digging away. They went, holy cow, it's ice. And they were just, you know, literally, uh, you could scoop that that deeply with a garden trowel, just one scoop away from striking an icy environment. Uh, so all this comes down to a set of probabilities. Did life arise on Mars? Could it have survived through the Hesperian? If it after the Hesperian in the Amazonian period, a quarter billion years or so, if Mars got so cold and so dry, could there still be liquid water environments on Mars? Uh, if there isn't, are there organisms that could exist in a solid ice, perpetual ice environment? We know these things happen on the Earth. The Allen Hills uh, Valley, where we have the dry Antarctic deserts, that's where the ozone hole lives. And frankly, surface radiation there is far higher than what you and I would experience going out on a sunny day because there's no ozone layer there to protect it. <clears throat> and so the question comes up, well, have we found life on Mars yet? Well, if you poll 100 scientists, first of all, you're not doing science, you're polling. And, uh, the scientific consensus is that, no, indeed, we haven't found life on Mars. But that's not the universal opinion of all scientists. And I will remind you that in science, opinions don't matter. Copernicus and Galileo were virtually alone in their opinion that the Earth orbited the sun. And the fact that the scientific consensus was extraordinarily against them did not make them wrong. Science isn't about polling. Science is about data. Uh, if you take a look at, how do you know, episode 22, uh, which is called the Viking experiments, you'll learn about Gilbert Levin, who we lost just last year, uh, a brilliant planetary scientist who built one of the experiments that landed on Viking. And the Viking people, the scientists, not just in NASA, but worldwide, agreed before Viking was launched. What do we need to see to say, yes, we've discovered life? Gilbert Levin's label release experiment met every single pre-established criteria for saying, yes, we've discovered bacterial life on Mars. <clears throat> uh, People, some of them quite powerful in the scientific community, didn't agree with Dr. Levin and Dr. Strait, who developed this and got the data back. And uh, Gilbert Levin maintained until his dying day that he was correct. However, to settle this controversy, we need boots on the ground. Dr. Levin was right. There are bacteria in the soil today on Mars, living bacteria. Um, is that correct? Is that not? You know what? Gilbert Levin's experiment amounts to six trials in just two locations. And he got consistent answers every time he did it. And he said, aha, I'm confident in my answer. The rest of the scientific community eventually did not agree with him. 
That doesn't make him wrong. That doesn't make him right. When will we find out? Boots on the ground, a garden trowel, and a microscope. Could answer this quite easily. Thank you very much. A sample return mission from Mars might answer this. What happens if the samples in their two-year journey back to the Earth die? Oh, well, there's evidence for past life, but it's not alive now. There's a lot of things that if you remove them from their native environment, they die. There are plants like this, there are animals like this, there are microbiological organisms like this. So, I don't know, rovers are amazing, and we might be able to make a rover, be a big darn thing, to uh, dig five or 10 meters down and get underground samples <clears throat> and then test them and look and see, is there microbiota present there? Uh, it's the only thing certain about that is no matter what answer they got, people would argue about it. There are people who are absolutely convinced that they are correct. And unfortunately, people on both sides are arguing with very little evidence. And most of it indirect and much of it indeterminate and subject to varying interpretations. So how do we know? Oh, hey, Dr. Barth, glad you're doing well. Thank you, JR. Yes, I'm <laughs> healthy and happy and uh, doing quite well, thank you. Um, so uh, these questions, friends, and we, we itch, we burn for the answers. We, we want to know. Uh, the viewers come to this program because how do you know? I want to know. Uh, well, <clears throat> yes, we all want to know, but sometimes when we're at the cutting edge of science, the answers can take weeks, months, years, decades. I'll remind you that the Earth-centered solar system and the Sun-centered solar system ideas, theories, coexisted for millennia. And until Galileo invented the astronomical telescope and turned it on the sky and investigated the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, nobody had developed the technology to run an experiment to effectively decide the controversy one way or the other. Even then, it took another century for the greater scientific community to finally accept the evidence and say, yes, Copernicus was right, Galileo was right. And I'll remind you that Galileo was imprisoned as a heretic in the 1630s, but he was forgiven by Pope John Paul the Great in 1992. So um, these issues may not be resolved in our lifetime. I believe they will be resolved. You know, the creek don't rise, civilization doesn't collapse. Uh, yeah, we will put boots on the ground on Mars. I hope it is within my lifetime because I think the first exploration on Mars would go a long, long way. It takes only one positive result to say, aha, life on Mars. Uh, you would have to dig a lot of places to say there are no currently inhabited environments on Mars. That would take a lot of investigation. Uh, I'll remind you that on Earth, we find bacteria eight or 10 kilometers down in the Earth. Uh, let's see, Facebook from Pekka. And isn't the life trace and fingerprints of present life on Mars are still preserved on the samples? Um, there are questions about that, Pekka, and certainly we know that the environments where Curiosity is exploring now have clay-like soils that are excellent. They are places you would want to dig to find fossilized evidence of macro and micro life on Earth. You would want to find a river delta that had dried up, where things had fossilized. Uh, things like uh, 
the Alberta uh, dinosaur deposits, the ones in Colorado, the ones in Mongolia. These are places that were ancient seas and riverbeds where there were clay deposits and silt deposits, and they entombed life and it became fossilized. And uh, <clears throat> the place where curiosity is looking today. I hope your curiosity will take you to the sky and out to your telescope uh, where we are here at the Explore Studios and at the Barthland Ranch in Northwest Arkansas. The skies are delightfully clear. So we are looking at a superb Halloween night and a great night to go out and take a look at the moon. Uh, take a look at the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter's at opposition and very big, very bright. And uh, Saturn and its moons are easily visible tonight. Uh, the deep sky stuff, um, not as easy to see under a first quarter moon, but the terminator of the moon uh, is fascinating and will show you lots of places along the terminator. Uh, Star Mentor will give you everything you need and things to do. We go, oh yeah, I've seen it. Messier objects, I've seen it. Uh, there's a lot more to explore. And the Star Mentor book will take you on many adventures and lead you and help you to explore the moon, clusters, nebula, galaxies, learning how to navigate and map the skies. So I wish you all clear skies on this Halloween night. You're all welcome to email me at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com. Please go ahead and pick up a copy of Star Mentor. And if you have kids at home or if you have a teacher in your life, please recommend that they look for the Astronomy for Educators text. Put that into any search engine. It's a free download. Uh, it is by far and away the most popular educational resource in astronomy in use in more than 8,500 schools in more than 60 countries serving uh, somewhere close to half a million students a year. So if you have a teacher in your life, be sure to tell them about Astronomy for Educators. I'm Dr. Daniel Barth here with for Explore Alliance. And we'll see you next week on How Do You Know? Thank you.